Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, there really is only one big star right now, Theresa May. There are lots of small stars softly glowing on the sidelines, that's the cabinet, but the new Prime Minister is a supernova in comparison, and we'll be focusing on what we know of her style of government in a few moments. Now here, Theresa May is very much on top, but for one who is so much the centre of attention, she does exhibit a certain reluctance to open up. That's not a criticism, it's just an observation. Tomorrow is her day when she makes the most important speech of her year, addressing the conference and the nation. That will be revealing. But today was her day too, with a number of interviews, all of us trying to get some kind of clue as to her intentions. At this point, retinence, retinent, reticence works to her advantage because everybody can say uh, they can see what they want in her. But can she really hope to sustain the acclaim? Well, Nick Watt has been looking at what's known about her personality and style. Rarely in our recent history has a political leader risen so far while revealing so little of themselves. In the autumn sunshine of Birmingham this week, our new Prime Minister, who's been on the front line of British politics for the best part of two decades, has finally started to open up. I've known Theresa <coughs> for a long time. I was the first to promote for a woman chairman. She became the first woman chairman of the Conservative Party. I did that. I worked with her close. I know that in Theresa there is real steel. This is an important feature. Theresa May is enjoying something of a political honeymoon, which is lasting longer than the brief excitement which greeted Gordon Brown in 2007, the last Prime Minister to take over without an election. Officials regard her as no drama Theresa and are struck by how she's taken the preparations for today's conference speech in her stride. Friends say that the honeymoon is not down to luck, but to years of planning. I think she was well prepared. You should remember, Nick, she was contemplating standing for leadership in 2005. Uh, and there's no criticism for her to say that she had that ambition. Uh, and I think she has thought hard and long. I think also, if I might say so, she's worked hard at her brief on whatever she's been doing, Home Secretary or whatever. And so she's, she's well prepared for coming into office. Theresa May has slipped naturally into her new role. The atmosphere in Downing Street is said to be orderly and calm, with meetings running to time. And her days as party chairman have paid off as she looks at ease with grassroots Tories in Birmingham. She is completely relaxed. I mean, she's somebody that is at home with the Conservative Party. Uh, she likes the Conservative Party. She came up through it. And I would think in just about every constituency, there'll be somebody that knows her. I think there is an element of this. I think the fact is that, um, and I'm sure the David Cameron would probably accept this, there, was, there wasn't a great love affair. Uh, with him. He got a job done, he got them into a position to win elections and he ran a difficult coalition for five years. I think however with Theresa there is an almost immediate sense that this is one of them. The Tories have long known that Theresa May is a pragmatist but this week she's been selling herself to the conference as a leader driven by political passions as she talks of tackling burning injustices. But if she wants to succeed, one former minister passed over in the reshuffle suggests that she should do more to build up a support base in Parliament. Theresa has been a member of our party and really at the core of our party, a councillor and chairman and going to association dinners for many, many years and, and, and really respected and liked because of all of that because people have got to know her. David never had that advantage because she was so much younger. But actually DC did go out into the tea room and he was in the members dining room. Uh, but she needs to do that. Those things are important. But she's more than capable of doing it. Look, listen, if you could socialise with all our wonderful members, you could socialise with the MPs. <laughs> Old colleagues say that even the happiest of honeymoons come to an end. And the inhabitants of Downing Street can become consumed by the inevitable incoming fire. The thing about being Prime Minister is that the bullets come from 360 degrees. 
and in, in other departments it's not so intense. But actually the department where it is most intense outside of number 10 is undoubtedly the Home Office, so she's got a very good training. You know, she's only got a majority of 11, so if five people in the Conservative Parliamentary Party are not on side and the other parties get their act together, then she won't be able to get, uh, get her wishes through the House of Commons. After a tumultuous few months for the Tories, Theresa May aims to set the seal on a lasting relationship with her party tomorrow. The next challenge is to win round the country by finally revealing the real Theresa May. Well, Nick's with me again. It's this whole programme today. Uh, and we're going to look ahead to that speech tomorrow. Nick, what do we know about the speech? Well, this is Theresa May's big chance to explain to the country her guiding philosophy. And if we want to get an idea of what her big message is, I think we need to look at a little notice section of her interview with the Sunday Times at the weekend when she said that government can be good. Now, she's talked a lot this week about how she wants to tackle burning injustices. And her view, her belief is that you can only really do that if you are prepared prepared to use the levers of the state and we should look at one of the key lines in the speech that she made in this city on the 11th of July when she launched her national leadership campaign which obviously didn't have to last very long <laughs> and she said we don't hate the state we value the role that only the state can play do you see an ism here is there a kind of a philosophy a guiding principle or something, an intellectual underpinning to all Well, I certainly see a rejection of one ism, because if you're saying you don't hate the state, then you are clearly rejecting Margaret Thatcher's famous statement that there's no such thing as society. And it's also a bit of a mild rebuke to David Cameron, who famously responded to Margaret Thatcher by saying there is such a thing as society, it's just not the same as the state, because he was a little aware of the state. But if we really want to know what's going on, what the philosophy is, we should turn to a friend of this programme, Danny Finkelstein, he's got his finger on the Tory pulse and he has got an interesting column in tomorrow's Times where he says to understand what Theresa May is up to, we've got to think of two moments in 20th century US history. Firstly, we've got to look back two decades to a famous editorial in the conservative American magazine, The Weekly Standard, which said that conservatives should talk about the role of government and not its limits. And then that editorial turned way back to the turn of the century and the Republican uh, uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, who embraced progressive ideas and demanded a square deal for workers. Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. Nick, thanks. Well, let's hear from the Prime Minister herself. She gave a number of tightly timed interviews uh, to broadcasters this afternoon before we had any foreknowledge of her speech. So, would she give us any clues as to her approach to government? We thought we might talk a little about moral dimensions to public life because you, in a way, wanted to change quite a lot about Britain and make it a country working for all. I just wondered whether there was a... whether that meant there was an ethical gap in your in your view of it, that you, you think needs to be filled. So I wanted to explore that with you. Well, I think it's very important that people don't feel that economic growth, that benefits of what is happening in society are only being felt by a privileged few. I think it is important that government ensures that we do have a country that works for everyone and, and that comes in different dimensions. It means an economy that works for everyone where economic benefits are spread more across the country. A society that works for everyone so individuals I've always believed that individuals need to have the opportunity to get on in life as far as their talents and hard work will take them. I want to explore it on a, a few specifics so let's take the issue of business and, and David Cameron once said he, he begrudged the fact that some companies put chocolate oranges by the checkout where you were tempted to buy them rather than real oranges so if I'm a company and I can make money by selling chocolate even though maybe it'd be better for the customers if I sold fruit. What, what, what should they be thinking there? Yeah. Well, in looking at businesses, I'm very clear that we need to deal with corporate irresponsibility yeah. when we see that, which is why I've already spoken about some of the changes I'm looking at in terms of corporate governance, and we'll be bringing forward some proposals later this year in that area. I think people want to feel that everybody plays by the same rules in the economy and feel that there isn't just one law for the privileged few and another law for everybody but else. Does that mean some, sometimes companies should do more than simply obey the law? When it comes to 
tax, for example, they say we obey the law, we follow the rules. Is that enough if you're pushing the rules to the very limit or not? Well, I think companies must recognise that actually they have a position in society too. Uh, they, you know, for any company, uh, they don't just uh, do things on their own. They have a reliance on people in their community, on their customers and so forth. This is why I'm talking about issues like customer, uh, consumer representation being on boards, worker representation being on boards. I think it's looking at that wider community in terms of the impact that a business has. Okay, so that could be a real change. Let's take another area which is party funding. You will know lots of people have given money to political parties and have ended up in the House of Lords. A lot of people would say that's not a country working for all, that's giving rich people more power over our country than other people. Could you imagine giving peerages to Conservative Party donors? Well, first of all, the uh, question about party funding is one, of course, that there have been several attempts to, to change the yeah. rules on party funding. One of the reasons why the attempts to change the rules on party funding and to bring in some limits to individual donations have faltered is because the Labour Party is unwilling to see changes to trade union funding of the Labour Party, which, of course, often has a direct impact on who they have elected as their leader and what policies they choose to follow. Yeah, but I'm, I, I'm, I didn't hear the answer to the question. Is it possible? Because I think others have but tried to get answer, to grips with this the and answer. they haven't. But I think you, you're going to try and get to grips with things that other people haven't got to grips with. So is it possible that you would be giving peerages to people who've made large donations to your party? The, the answer to that is, Evan, that at the moment, with everything I'm looking at, the last thing I'm thinking about is giving peerages to people. I've got a task to do as Prime Minister. It's to deliver to reinstate some trust for the British people but with this is their politicians. This is an issue well, of but trust. there's a bigger issue of trust that we have at the moment, which is us delivering on the Brexit vote that took place on June the 23rd. But this means you could be giving peerages to people who are giving I big donations, and that's, that isn't a country working for all. This is the most simple example that you, Theresa May, could stop here and now in this interview by just saying, by the way, give money to the Tories, we're not going to give you a peerage. Well, what I think is important in terms of the honour system, and I said this the other day, is that it is a, an honour system that rewards those who have made contributions to our society. If you look at the vast majority of people who receive honours, actually they are people who are working in their local communities, who are working yeah. with charities. I think it's important that we have a system that recognises when people are uh, contributing to our society in that way. Let me try one last one. Foreign policy. Robin Cook famously talked about an ethical dimension to foreign policy. Do you see foreign policy as needing a strong ethical dimension? And I, I would cite an example, which is British arms sales to Yemen. Select committee reports have said those are probably being used uh, to perpetrate atrocities in Saudi. We're selling the arms to Saudi Arabia, but atrocities in Yemen being perpetrated by British weapons. Is that something Britain should be doing or not? Well, first of all, we have one of the strongest regimes in terms of uh, exports of arms it, anywhere it, of any country in the world. Is it working in this case? Oh. Is it working in this case? We have one of the strongest regimes in relation to arms exports of any country in the world. We've been very clear, I've been very clear, personally with Saudi Arabia, that we expect these issues to be properly investigated uh, and, if necessary, lessons to be learned. But it's... What is important in foreign policy, I think, first of all, is that we consider what is in the British national interest. We are going to be taking, continuing to take, but enhancing our global role, our role on the world stage, as we come out of the European Union. That's about the partnerships we form around that. the whole of the world. But I think people listening to this would say, what I'm hearing from Theresa May is not quite as different to what I might have expected I would be hearing about a new regime, new ethical standards, a determination, if you like, to sweep away some of the privileges and institutions that have been dominating or existing, at least, in, in British public life. Are you that determined to change things? Well, if you listen to my speech that I'm going to give to the party conference tomorrow, I'm setting out the sort of economic and social reform that I want to see for a country that works for everyone. Theresa May, thank you very much. Theresa May, thank you very much. Well, with us here is the Cabinet Minister, James Brokenshire, Northern Ireland Secretary. He's someone, actually, who served in the uh, Home Office under Theresa May and is seen as one of her closest allies in the Cabinet. It's interesting just watching that with you, uh, James. It, she really isn't somebody who gives. She retreats quite often to safe lines on the different issues rather than thinking aloud or venturing out. Is that because she doesn't quite know what her mind is or because she's keen to not not to say too much at this point in her tenure.
Well, I think from all of my experience in working with Theresa over the last six and a bit years, throughout her time as Home Secretary, she's been very much a big picture issue person, as well as down into the detail. And I think what you see from her is that you know, clarity of what she understands, what she is going to get across in terms of the themes that matter to her. She's a very serious politician, thinks very carefully about everything that she says, because you know, she's very much into that level of detail. She wants to, I think, think things through rather than giving off-the-cuff right. answers. She doesn't want, it's to that, it's that level of detail. doesn't want to blurt stuff out. Um, I, I suppose there's a, it's a little bit reminiscent of Gordon Brown. It's a sort of just not quite answering the question whenever it's given. No, I, 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 can't, I can't see that. No? <laughs> I can't see that comparison at all. I think it's, it's just the, the very focused, very detailed approach that the yeah. Prime Minister gives. And I think that that's absolutely the skill that we need at the moment when we're looking at Brexit, when we're looking at this detailed negotiation yes. that we have coming yes. up. Yes. And so it is that approach, I think, that she rightly okay. brings to all of this. Disciplined messaging, so she's not going to get string. Well, let's talk about Brexit. Let's talk about your patch, Northern Ireland. Island, because you will know the whole issue of the border between the north and the south is a very sticky one. Can I just ask, is it possible Britain will leave not just the single market, is it possible Britain will not be in the so-called customs union that is the European Union at the moment, which is effectively a kind of a trading zone with a wall around it that has tariffs on certain items coming from abroad. Is it possible we'll, we'll be we've, outside that? We've come to no conclusions in relation yeah, to possible. this, Evan. Well, we, we've come to no conclusions. Right. So There's been no analysis right. that, that concludes Good. on this. So, you know, we're not going to leave a running commentary. No, 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 as no, you no. Well, well I know. Well, let's not go through all the usual lines. So it is possible no. because you haven't come to a conclusion on it. So it's possible. The bit I want to investigate with you is if there is a, if there is a, if, if, the south of Ireland is in one side of a customs, in one customs union, and the north is in a different one. There has to be a customs post of some kind between the two, doesn't there? Well, as I say, we have come to no conclusions. We are seeking to achieve the best outcome of the negotiations for but Northern Ireland. This is just and parroting the, the stuff. Come on, you're just come parroting. On, come on. Okay, just come. answer the question. Uh, we, we, will, we, will, we will be uh, obviously coming to that as part of the analysis, as part of that point. But the point is that there is a real strong desire to see that we don't return to the borders of the past, something that I've explained and been very clear on, how we have have the common travel area that has served us since about 1923 the between the Republic area. of Ireland and the United Kingdom and also that sense of the land border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and how that benefits us in goods and services also in terms of equally the politics and the identity of all of this. I understand the objective everybody shares the objective the question is if Britain for example is importing stuff from the United States without paying tariffs and the European Union wants to charge tariffs on those items, the European Union will say we have to have a customs post there, otherwise people will import it into the north of Ireland, export it into the south without paying the European tariff, and customs union won't work. Now, have you worked out, with your officials, a way of Britain not being in, a, in the customs union without having a customs post? I think what I would say to you, Evan, is that as we have not reached any conclusions, I'm not going to comment on the detail of, of what we're preparing, but we are working very, very closely with the Irish government, who have this shared objective because of the benefits for the Irish economy and also the UK economy it, around this. Is it acceptable that there might be a customs post, not a border? Maybe it'll be an honesty box customs post that as you drive across, you pop the coins in the tariff with the, for the goods you're, you're driving across, or maybe won't actually be a physical honesty box, it'll be a system in which you have to make a declaration within 30 days of exporting or something like that. Well, I, Is that I, an, are, all, are all these acceptable ways of Britain leaving the customs well, union? Well, I, I understand your desire to try to get more detail. As I say, we're, we're, not, going to, we're not going to sort of provide that level of detail on this, but I, I can say very clearly, we want to see the freest trade of goods and services between the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland. Okay. That real benefit that we see. And yes, the way that technology has moved on, the way in which I talked about no, the no, common no, traveller, and the way that, that, that actually the digital use of information, right. absolutely, it is all of these issues that we are discussing very clearly with the Irish government. So these may be able to give us an answer. Look, just, uh, let's just move on to one other thing. Amber Rudd today has hinted um, in, in her briefings that companies might be asked to publish how many international staff they employ, the proportion of their staff that are international as opposed to British. Do you think it's something shameful about companies employing foreign, foreign staff? Is that something they should be embarrassed about? Should they be targeting that number to try and get it down? Well, 
As a government, we've been saying very clearly that we want to attract the brightest and the best, the skilled and the talented, to come to the United Kingdom to contribute to our economic growth and prosperity. That's certainly something that I was very clear on when I was at the Home Office making those very points. But I think that when we look at transparency, when we look at, yes, those pressures that are there on our public services, on the pressures of the speed and rate of change of migration, it is about how we bring greater controls, and yes, about transparency. Shaming companies because they employ lots of foreigners. Well, is that, is I, I that, think, is that I think what we've come to? Is that, the, is that the country that is outward looking, open and wo open to the world that we've been talking about since the referendum? But I think, I think that there's a real issue in relation to skills, for example. Companies, well, in, companies in the UK have underinvested in skills and training of our workers here in, in this country. And therefore, that sense of the more work that we need to do to see that we're giving the skills to our workers here, equally with the apprenticeships, the 2.9 million that we've developed, I think it is all about all of these issues together and why this is a complex issue when you look at controlling but publish, migration. But then wouldn't you want to publish something on their skills or their training budget or the number of apprentices? But to focus on the number of foreigners that you employ, and this company is employing this many foreigners, this proportion, is that really the Britain you want to be, you want to be living in? Well, what I want to do, in, and what I want to see as a, a government, is that we are outward looking, as we are, that we're attracting skilled workers to come to our country to uh, provide that real strength and growth that we continue to want to see. But I think it is important that we do focus on skills and training, on that balance of employment, so that we're seeing that, obviously, as Amber has been highlighting in her speech today, we want to consult on new migration policies. We want to see how we, yes, can bring those controls, because that's what matters. That was the message that came very clearly from the referendum. James and that's what Amber's been saying through her speech today. James Brokenshaw, thank, thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, if the Conservative Party is a delicate ecology of different political creatures, then there's one species which is noticeable by its absence here in Birmingham, the so-called Cameroons, friends and allies of the former Prime Minister. There have been few sightings, so we sent our resident twitcher, Lewis Goodall, to try and find some evidence of them. The most endangered species at this conference are the Cameroons, and we at Newsnight are worried about their welfare. They used to be dominant here. Some worry they're now extinct. We're going to try and find them. You haven't seen any Cameroons knocking around, have you at all? No. Cameroons? Yes. Well, no, I don't think I have, actually. We were looking for some Cameroons. Have you seen a George Osborne, Michael Gove? Anyone seen a Cameroon? They used to be everywhere. You know, you're yeah. trying to find an endangered yeah. species, but they're... Um... Do you miss them? I, you know, miss is a strong word, isn't it? George Osborne, Michael Gove, they used to run this place. George Osborne, used to be Chancellor, probably dressed a bit like me. I'm a predator. I can do this. Would you say you were sort of a Cameroon, Mr Gork? Well, David Cameron was a very good Prime Minister. Well, that was another very good Prime Minister. Mr Willett, you are a Cameroon, aren't you? I certainly served under David Cameron's government and was proud to do so. Are you worried that that part of the party is, has disappeared, has flown the nest, migrated north? No, I think that the um, modernisers and moderates in the party are uh, alive, well and kicking and well represented in the cabinet, including me. There's only one thing for it. Hello there, Mr Gove. Is this it? Hello there, it's um, Lewis Goodall here from Newsnight. Hi, Lewis. Hi. Hello. Nice to speak to you. I'm making a piece about sort of what's happened to the Cameroons because we can't really find any. I just wondered if you knew. <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty around. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't help you more. Oh well, I'm sorry. I, I, we're just sort of slightly worried they might be extinct. Um... <laughs> Lewis Goodall there. He got the Gove interview. Everybody wants to interview Michael Gove. Uh, well, that's day three of the Conservative Party conference. Tomorrow's the last day. Some would say that's fortunate because the pound's been sinking, really, since the Tories got here, and we can't afford for them to keep the conference going. I've been